Hi everyone, Eva here. I am so excited to have you here with me today because I have none other than Dr. Ellen Jensen. She's a world-renowned iridologist and nutritionist. And it is quite uh, my pleasure to have her here with me. She has a very, very busy schedule, but I know a lot of you follow iridology, that you're interested in iridology. And I just think this is a fascinating subject. I met Dr. Jensen at the Hippocrates Health Institute where she lectured and I have been fascinated with iridology ever since. So uh, without further ado, hello, doctor. How are you today? Hello, it's so nice to be here with you, Ava, and to um, talk about my favorite passion, which is iridology and nutrition. So without going any further, what exactly is iridology and how is it used? Well, I've become very um, passionate about iridology because it's the study of the color and the structure of the iris of the eye, which is the colored part of the eye, um, to tell us what's going on with the organs, glands, and systems of the body. Mm. So iridology, um, I'll show you my iridology chart, which maps out all parts of the iris. And the iris, each iris has 28,000 nerve endings in it that go to all parts of the body. And the border of the pupil has over a million nerves that connect through the optic nerve and the spinal cord that go out through all parts of the body. So the iris is able to tell us a great deal about what's going on with the health of that person, especially the genetics of that person. And so I use iridology and iridologists use it to be able to see uh, what's going on. You can even see in a little child if diabetes was in the family or heart trouble was in the family. And I love it for that reason because we can use it for prevention as well as for nutritional advice after the problem has already started. Wow, I did not know about the, the children. You can also see genetic, genetic issues with children. Yes, and I use an iridology camera in my practice to take the eye pictures and I put them up on a computer screen so I can show them all their strengths and all the areas that we need to nurture and take care of. Oh my goodness. So Dr. Jensen, can you share with us a little bit of the history of iridology? How did it come about? Where did it come from? It seems ancient, but at the same time, it's almost like new age. Well, years ago, I was interested in that same question. And I wrote this book through the eyes of the masters. And I took all of Bernard Jensen, who was my mentor, um, books from his library, and a lot of those were all the way back from the 1800s, and I really poured through them to find out where iridology started, and we found remnants of iridology in ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. um, Hippocrates himself in 460 BC stated, behold the eyes, behold the body, and I learned that he used all parts of the eyes to tell what was going on with the health of the person. I learned that in Germany, during the war, they didn't have any opportunity to use x-rays. So they were able to look in the eyes and they started charting the eyes. The first evidence, uh, the first iridology chart that was actually drawn, was drawn by Ignaz von Pexley in Budapest, Hungary in the 1800s. And von Pexley started seeing markings in people's eyes. And after seeing hundreds of people, and they all had a marking at three o'clock in the left iris uh, with heart trouble, he drew a map of it. And after seeing hundreds of people with a certain marking, uh, that had kidney problems, he drew a map of it. So he ended up mapping out what he could see. And then Niels Lilliquist in Sweden about the same time, he was younger than Ignaz, was mapping out the chart in a similar way, but they didn't have email back then. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And so nobody knew about each other. But Bernard Jensen pulled all the charts together from all over the world. And then he saw 300,000 patients because he had a huge health center with 200 acres in his life. And so he started comparing the charts in his own research and put a chart together. And then I added 25 years of research to that chart. Wow. So the, the history of iridology is in depth. And now we have doctors in Italy and France that have shone a light in the eyes in specific areas to affect healing on those organs that we know to connect to those areas through the eyes. And um, they have been successful. So there's still a lot of ongoing research. And um, I work with the International Iridology Practitioners Association. And we have iridologists all over the world that we can collaborate with. And, and if we see a new iris sign, we're able to send it and get information right away. So now more research on iridology is being done than ever before. Wow, this is fascinating. And, and how did you become interested in iridology? How, how did that come about? Well, when I was a little girl, I had scoliosis, which is when your back curves like an S. It was genetic in my family. And I ended up going to an orthopedic hospital and my parents uh, felt like, and that's all that they knew at the time, to have surgery on my spine. So I endured a lot of pain, both emotionally and physically through spinal surgery. And when I grew up wanting to help people, and so I ended up teaching in public schools, children with learning disabilities and handicaps. And then I wanted to go on and study more. And I found a book by Dr. Bernard Jensen on iridology. And for me, it just opened worlds because mm -hmm. it was a non-invasive form of analysis without needles, knives, and drugs. So I ended up studying iridology, herbology, and nutrition all over the world, wherever I could find information. Mm -hmm. um, Cherokee Indian herbalist, Amish herbalist. I went to Switzerland and studied two years with a, a doctor there, um, all kinds of nutrition. And I studied with Bernard Jensen and worked with him for many, many years. Okay. That's fascinating. And how can a person become an iridologist or how, how would someone go about if they were interested in this field? Well, they need to go to our website. Um, my website is myinfiniteiris.com and our organization called IPA, the International Iridology Practitioners Organization. We set that up to be a certifying body Okay. So that people would study accurate information. Right. So they can go to that website, uh, iridologyassn.org. And they can, uh, both the websites explain quite well how they can study with an IPA certified diplomat instructor and become an iridologist. So um, it's very important that they really have good quality education mm. with anatomy and physiology and all the information that they learn in iridology and nutrition before they become a practitioner. Okay, so that was a question that I had. Is there a lot of um, is there a lot of misinformation when it comes to iridology? Is there? There's a lot out there. Okay. Um, that was one reason. When Bernard Jensen passed away, he held my hand and asked me to promise I would carry on iridology. And as I had traveled around the country, I saw a lot of people calling themselves iridologists and uh, saying quite harmful things in a way to people because they hadn't really had any scientific study. Mm -hmm. And so um, it can be used incorrectly. Um, and so that's why we formulated IPA, 
and I have worked with it for many, many, many years to um, have quite quality, scientifically based research information. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because I know it seems to be trending now. A lot of people are calling themselves a radiologist, and you, you just don't know who to trust. That's why I went to see you. <laughs> well, I'd like to say if they go on the IPO website, iridologyassn.org, you'll see a flag for many countries where we have trained, qualified iridologists and iridology instructors. Okay. So they can trust that those people have been through rigorous training and um, they can find them in their area. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so my next question is to do with nutrition, because I know when I went to see you on a personal visit, you stressed the importance of nutrition and you gave me some advice and, and you also have written this book and I've been reading it. I'm not quite done with it yet, but it, it is fascinating and it tells a lot about your story as well. So I highly, highly recommend this book. But what can a person learn by reading this book and why is nutrition so important in the healing and then in the, in the it goes so well with iridology? Well, iridology is a tool that we can see what's going on within the body, but it doesn't treat the problem as such. It tells us what areas to work with. Mm. And Bernard Jensen called iridology and nutrition twins because without one, the other one doesn't work very well. Mm. And so when we see areas of deficiency within the iris from genetic standpoint, for example, the lungs areas, we can give the nutrients that support the lungs to help them become stronger. For example, I would use um, mullein tea. Mullein is a wonderful herb for soothing and strengthening the lungs and helping a person to cough up and get rid of mucus. Mm -hmm. So once we see the area that needs help in the iris, we're able to recommend really good nutrition to help strengthen those areas in that person. Okay, so it does go hand in hand, nutrition and iridology. So there are certain things that you can see in the eye that you can then recommend certain nutritional therapies as well as herbal therapies. Absolutely. Uh, you see, people have forgotten that we're literally made from the dust of the earth. We're made from the elements of the earth. And without those elements, elements, 90 essential nutrients a day, those organ areas start to fail. And Bernard Jensen was a master teacher in nutrition. And I learned so much about each organ and organ system and which nutrients are needed specifically for those organs. For example, the thyroid, which is located right here, must have iodine to function. And if there's a lot of radiation in the atmosphere, such as there was in Chernobyl, those people got goiter and Hashimoto's uh, because it gets rid of the iodine, so it weakens the thyroid. Mm. So those people that were eating seaweed during that time avoided a lot of those thyroid problems because seaweed is so high in natural iodine. Mm. So every organ has nutrients specific to that organ and foods that have those nutrients are what we eat every day or should be eating as close to pure, whole, and natural from the earth as we possibly can because we're, we come from the earth. People have forgotten that we truly are organic beings and earth is our mother. And so the closer we can get back to the earth and the natural way the earth provides food for us, the healthier we'll become. Okay, so I have a question then about the raw vegan diet. Uh, a lot of my viewers are following that sort of diet. Is that an appropriate diet in your opinion? Does it cover all the nutritional bases that our body needs? Or is yes, if it's done properly. Okay. 
Okay. Yes, it's amazing if it's done properly. Um, but but a lot of people go raw vegan and they're ending up still eating a lot of refined white sugar. And so there's a way that's important to learn about that diet. And because any refined elements like sugar are very harmful for us because like when I'm in Costa Rica, I go out in the fields and eat sugar cane because sugar cane has all the nutrients and the fiber to help us process the sugar. Mm -hmm. But mankind came along and isolated sugar, uh, very sweet, and it can become very addictive, but it's causing all kinds of problems. It feeds viruses and bacteria. It damages the insulin levels in the pancreas, so people become diabetic. It causes many, many problems in our bodies. So that's just one example, but we need to be as natural as we possibly can when we go to the raw vegan diet. Chewing is very important, too. If we don't chew well a raw vegan diet, okay. if we're still following our old habits of rushing and hurrying, right. then um, we won't absorb the nutrients from it as well. Okay, that, that's so important. And what about a fruitarian diet, in your opinion? Is that a healthful way to eat the people that are eating a lot of their calories from fruit? Well, I have a few questions about that. Uh, some people seem to do okay with it. I've not seen a lot of people do well with it, just because it can be high even in fruit sugar and perhaps low in protein. And so I try to listen to each body, each person, and see how they're functioning with that particular nutritional program. Mm, that makes sense. So it's not one size fits all. No. No. Mm. Okay. Now, in my practice, I've seen the all meat diet. I've seen the all fruit diet. I've seen the all fat diet, the all non-fat diet. And I just feel like sometimes it can become extreme mm -hmm. and people are leaving out some of the nutrients that they would really need. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Dr. Jensen, I have a question about the lymph and I, I just wanna, I wrote it down because it's so important. We talk a lot about the lymph and the congestion of the lymph. How would that show in the eye? Because I know so many people talk about the lymph and how it shows up, but I just don't know to what extent that's accurate. So I have a picture here for you. Can you see this picture just fine? Yes. So the in this eye, there are, it's like a chain of pearls oh going around in the sixth zone of the iris. And that's a person that has inherited uh, a a lymph system that doesn't function as well as possibly other lymph systems will. And it can be it can be white or yellowish in color with more years of time. It can become more yellow. And that's a person that uh, really needs to work with cleansing their lymph to keep it eliminating well. Mm -hmm. uh, our lymph is like a drainage system. It's like a river of life that flows through our body and it lines our joints, it lines our sinuses, our lungs, our digestive tract. It flows right underneath the skin. It lines our eyes. So people need to really understand how the lymph system works because the only thing that moves it is exercise, skin brushing, and massage. Mm. So because the heart pumps the blood, but the only thing that moves the lymph are those three things, exercise, skin brushing, and massage. So with skin brushing, a lot of people have not heard of that. So you get a, a natural vegetable bristle brush, it's about that big around, with a long wooden handle at your health food store, and you need to brush up your arms toward your heart because the lymph dumps out just below the heart and we want to move the lymph toward that area and 
the skin is the largest organ of elimination. It is like a third kidney. So brushing the skin not only moves the lymph, but it eliminates toxins from the lymph through the skin, prevents skin tags, molds, and skin cancers, and cellulite. And also they need to brush their, from their feet I include the bottoms of their feet. Mm. There are uh, acupuncture points in the bottoms of the feet that connect to all parts of the body. Brush from the feet all the way up the legs toward the heart. And then you can brush from your back down and around toward your heart. So I feel like skin brushing just before your shower Mm. It's very important to eliminate toxins from the lymph in the skin and keep the lymph flowing. And then shower with purified water to eliminate what you've brushed out. And it's important to exercise because exercise moves the lymph. My favorite exercises for the lymph are jumping on a mini trampoline okay. called a rebounder. Mm. And that moves the lymph. It's some people have called it a lymphocyzer. It's amazing for moving the lymph. And then walking, swinging your arms, moves the lymph, riding a bicycle, um, jogging. So many exercises crucial for moving the lymph, as well as helping us absorb our vitamins and minerals, because exercise is equally important to nutrition. Okay, so th uh, that's something that I do, but I always wondered how long should you body brush for and how long should you rebound for? Well, I feel like it's different for everybody. Okay. Because it can't, uh, I've been doing my practice for 30 years and after seeing, you know, some people are very weak and can only do a little bit on the rebounder. Mm -hmm. Some people are older and they need the handlebar mm -hmm. and some people just, don't come up off the rebounder they just kind of stay there and move but it's still important okay um so i would say for a healthy person to jump on the rebounder 15 minutes maybe once or twice a day play some nice music say some affirmations while you're on the rebounder i'm healthy i'm strong i'm whole i'm well um running you know um jumping jacks on the rebounder, sort of running in place on the rebounder. Mm -hmm. All of those are great exercises. So I feel like it's different for everybody. Okay. But if you're healthy, at least 15 minutes on the rebounder once or twice a day. Okay. And then skin brushing, um, if you're healthy, five to 10 minutes before you shower. Okay. It's good. I mean, you don't have to make a whole long process because you're doing it every day. Okay. Okay. I, I might do that too fast then because I only spend about a minute or two. So I'm going to do it a little bit longer. And <laughs> our skin tags, you mentioned skin tags, skin tags. I see a lot of people with a lot of skin tags. Um, I see some red ones. I see some brown ones. Are those related to the lymph? Well, they're a virus that's carried in the lymph and they're trying to come out of the body. Oh. And, and so skin brushing helps prevent them, but to get rid of them, I highly recommend colloidal silver. Oh. So silver massaged into those skin tags um, daily helps to eliminate them because it kills the virus at the root. Oh my goodness, that's a great tip. You know, my dad has a lot of skin tags. I'm going to tell him that. <laughs> well, he can take silver internally as well. Okay. And, and that should be taken daily then, the silver. Yes. And I will tell you, I like the silver, not to advertise at all, but I really like natural cast silver wing silver because it has the smallest particle size. Okay. So it clears the liver really well. Oh, wow. That's invaluable information. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jensen, can you talk a little bit about, um, we hear this a lot, acidity. People are too acidic, uh, the importance of being alkaline. Can you speak of this? Can you enlighten us a little bit with this acidity issue that people seem to be having? Oh, yes. 
I think acidity is happening a lot, especially today, because people are so stressed. Oh. And stress is one of the number one causes of acidity. And what becomes acidic in the body is the lymph, the clear fluid. Um, so when you're, you're stressed, you're pumping adrenaline. And too much adrenaline creates acidity in the body. Now, we need adrenaline if there's a fire and we're trying to get out of the house or lift a piece of furniture off a child or whatever. Um, you know, adrenaline serves us that way when there's a trauma. But to be at a stoplight and pumping adrenaline because you're late right. or to be rushing throughout your day, I find so many people rushing today all the time with no harmony and peace from the inside. And so um, acidity comes, number one, from stress. It also comes from an acidic diet. And Bernard Jensen recommended eight vegetables a day and two fruits, I mean, six vegetables a day and two fruits a day, which equals 80% alkaline. And he loved for people to have variety because there are many nutrients in different vegetables and fruits. Um, now, when you eat a very acidic diet, when you um, process foods, sugary foods, fried foods are all on the acid side, but so are grains, beans, and meat. And so if you eat some grains or beans or meat, it needs to keep it on the smaller side of your diet and keep your diet more on the alkaline side. Mm. And so um, acidity, I want to talk about what it causes. Uh, it, when the lymph is acidic, it causes inflammation and pain. can cause pain in the muscles, pain in the joints. It also then, the lymph, because it's supposed to be alkaline, will suddenly start pulling minerals out of the bone because it's trying to get those minerals to alkalinize itself. But where does it put those minerals? It deposits them in the joints where there can become arthritic crystals. It deposits them uh, in the kidneys where we can have kidney stones. So when it can deposit in the feet um, and, and just cause pain everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I've had people with nodules around their joints and their fingers. I'm sure you've seen them. Mm -hmm. And when I put them on a juice, made with celery, green apple, and lemon, every day they go away. Now, why is that? Because we're alkalinizing the lymph. When the lymph becomes alkaline, it starts helping to dissolve those crystals, put them back in the bone. And so Dr. Jensen called it calcium out of solution. It comes out of solution when we are acidic. So there are ways we can help ourselves if we have arthritis. Osteoporosis is another symptom of acidity. By drinking that juice every day and getting more alkaline vegetables and fruits in our diet. So this is very interesting, Dr. Jensen, because I know a lot of my viewers are either vegan, raw vegan, or whole food plant-based. And you mentioned about the beans and people do tend to eat a lot of beans when they're in this type of a diet. What are your favorite sources of protein? And I know that there's an obsession with protein and I do not subscribe to that obsession, but I know people always talk about it. You know, what, what do you recommend if beans are too acidic? What other forms of protein do you recommend? Well, I really like to soak nuts and seeds. And so when I soak like sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds overnight, mm. they become twice as nutritious with strong enzymatic activity to help you absorb the protein. Mm -hmm. They have then let half the fat, so there's less fat for the liver to have to process. Mm -hmm. And when you soak them overnight, you rinse them and you put them in the blender with a little bit of purified water and make them into a cream. 
So that cream is very delicious. You can put it on salads. You can use it as a dip. You can put it on soups. So you're getting great protein. It's also alkaline forming. Mm -hmm. And it gives you so much good protein that's highly absorbable. Mm, okay, good. Very good advice. And if you soak your beans, the same thing happens. So they become more alkaline, more nutritious and more easy to absorb and digest. And beans have enzyme inhibitors in them that, have, that block our enzymes that are trying to digest them. And so when you soak them, it breaks those enzyme inhibitors. So beans can be a good protein. I just highly recommend that people with digestive issues soak them overnight. Okay, and what about sprouted beans? Is that something you recommend? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're amazing. They are powerhouses of protein and nutrients. And those sprouted beans are crunchy and delicious. And we put them on our salad. They're just wonderful. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's speak a little bit about the thyroid and all the seemingly endless thyroid issues people are having today. What's going on with the thyroid? How can we help the thyroid? How do you help your clients with thyroid issues? So many people have thyroid issues today. Yeah. Yes. I believe there's more radiation in the atmosphere than people realize. Um, for from leaks from you know power plants or whatever. Um, and also the other main cause, and hear me on this, of thyroid problems is a congested liver. Okay. So, so what congests the liver um, is sugar. Primary cause of high cholesterol is sugar. Not so much good fats or fats, but sugar. Fats will and fried foods will. But sugar and, and flour, gluten, are very sticky and gluey. And they glue up the bile in the liver so that therefore cannot process the thyroid hormones as well. So T3 and T4, which are very important thyroid hormones, need to be converted in the liver or your thyroid will go low. Oh, okay. And the number one mineral element for the liver is selenium. And selenium is to the liver as calcium to the bones. So to help your thyroid, we need to cleanse the liver. Oh. So in my book, Health is Your Birthright, I have an extensive liver cleanse. But if you just uh, eat, for example, I'll go 15 days on just blended raw vegetables. I, I do these types of cleanses on myself because I feel so good. And they're like brooms that just sweep the liver clean. Mm -hmm. And these raw juices, which um, um, when we use celery, cucumber, apple, lemon, and beet. Beet is very powerful for cleansing the liver and gallbladder mm -hmm. and making them dump bile into the small intestine where we need it for absorption of nutrients. So keeping the liver clean, water with lemon throughout the day, water with raw apple cider vinegar throughout the day. Mm. Raw apple cider vinegar has amazing properties. And only raw apple cider vinegar um, works because most vinegar is made from the peelings that mm. have been heavily sprayed and cooked really to high temperatures. Okay. Raw apple cider vinegar is highly absorbable potassium and it kills viruses, strep, it, it definitely kills the strep germ, and it dissolves hardening and plaque in the liver. It helps dissolve stone. Mm -hmm. It will stop a cramp within a couple of minutes, raw apple cider vinegar. So when you put a tablespoon or two in a glass of water and drink it, your cramp will stop within a minute or two. It's amazing. Wow. Um, I've even had people dip cloths in vinegar and wrap the area 
that's cramping or swollen. It gets rid of swelling. It's a natural diuretic because of the potassium. But keeping the liver clean helps the thyroid. And the other thing that helps the thyroid so much are seaweed. Now, when I travel in Asia, the mothers are giving their children seaweed for snacks, um, even in the airport. It's not cookies and candy, it's seaweed snacks. And I just think that's amazing because they have less thyroid problems than we have over here. Mm -hmm. So if people can just get back into eating seaweed, and it can be very delicious, mm -hmm. the leaf called dough from the ocean, you want to get it from the cold waters of Nova Scotia or Sweden, where the waters are still more pure, and you can dehydrate it. And it becomes very crunchy and delicious on salads. Uh, nori is another great seaweed that you can use for a wrap. And you can grate carrots and put avocado in there and sprouts and roll it up. It's very mm -hmm. delicious. Mm -hmm. Tzatziki is another wonderful sea vegetable that when you soak it, becomes like a crunchy noodle. It's really great in salads. Um, so I just feel like people have gotten away from these natural seaweeds that um, have been given to us by God in nature to keep our thyroids healthy. Now, if the thyroid is hyperactive, um, we need to calm it down. So the herbs I use for that are lemon balm, bugleweed, and motherwort. Mm -hmm. And those herbs really soothe and calm a hyperthyroid. So um, there's just so much to do with our thyroid. It's just so important. If they have nodules on their thyroid, I will recommend uh, cumin seed oil, black cumin seed oil. Okay. Mixed with some olive oil, half and half, and just massage to help uh, dissolve those those nodules while they're getting on a cleansing, healing, nutritional program. Okay. So the thyroid issues are they? You mentioned why it's happening, but are they? Uh, can they totally be fixed with nutrition, or because I know some people are taking the medications no matter what are they to what extent can we manage thyroid issues with nutrition i've seen them heal a hundred percent okay but again everybody's different and you know they need to be on a very good program just for them okay but um, if they follow these nutritional um guidelines that i've given for the thyroid it'll start having improvements right away. Mm, okay. Um, can you speak a little bit of anti-aging? <laughs> I know a lot of my viewers are ladies and I get these questions a lot. They speak about hair loss as we age, obviously skin conditions and, you know, sagging and wrinkles and all of that. And uh, it's something that I, I, we, I talk a lot about with my clients. Can you speak of the importance of nutrition and how that helps hair and skin and aging in general. So important. Um, I have found that we need a rhythm in life. We need to get our sleep. We need to get our good water. We need to take time to pause, to eat and digest really well. Mm -hmm. um, those all help us stay younger. Because when we get under stress, we're acidic and we're rapidly aging the body. Mm -hmm. And if you know the natural element that strengthen the hair, it's the one, the most important element for the hair, skin, and fingernails is silicon. And silicon is the mineral found in oat straw tea asparagus, radishes, nuts and seeds, things like that. Uh, silicon will help bring the hair back mm -hmm. and the skin stronger and tighter. Now, oat straw tea doesn't come in a nice, neat little tea bag. 
Okay. It comes as straw. And I've helped so many people calm their nerves. Silicon's important for the nerves without straw tea and get their hair strong again. So you can buy oat straw either at, <clears throat> at your health food store or from a really reputable um, herbal dispensary. Mm. And a rule of thumb is one heaping teaspoon per cup. Okay. So I would have them boil a quart of water. And when it starts boiling, add four teaspoons of the straw and turn it down to simmer for about 10 minutes and turn it off and let it sit with the lid on it for about 20 minutes. Drain it and you can drink it warm or cool. I don't recommend too hot or too cold oh. because of the digestion. But it's very powerful for strengthening skin, hair, and nails. And you can also wash your hair with it. Oh. Yeah. So um, oat straw tea is one of my favorite elements for keeping us young, as well as all the good nutrition. When you are eating whole, pure, and natural food and really digesting it, when I look under a live blood cell um, uh, microscope, people that are eating uh, toxic, sticky foods full of sugar and fried foods, their blood is all clumped together. Oh. And that's called RULO. So they're aging, they're tired, they're fatigued. And when you start eating a more living diet with more vegetables and fruits, and raw juices, those blood cells are bouncing around all happy under there. Mm. And that in itself is very important, and as well as getting all the minerals and vitamins you need to keep your bones strong. Mm. Okay. So meditation and proper breathing also prevent aging because when you are breathing properly, it's impossible for the adrenals to fire and cause stress. Stress is the number one cause of aging. Mm. That makes so much sense. <laughs> or sh I'm a shallow breather, so I'm trying to do better in that department. So if they'll pause for a minute, maybe right now, and close the eyes and put the hands over the abdomen and get in touch with the breath, and then let go and allow yourself to breathe slow and easy in through your nose and out through your nose, allowing the abdomen to rise and fall. Mm -hmm. That abdominal breathing prevents free radicals from causing us to age. And it looks simple, but it's not so easy but we need to practice it. And when, and I recommend 15 minutes a day of sitting quietly about the same time and closing your eyes and getting in touch with your breath. And then starting with your feet, squeezing and relaxing. Your lower legs, squeezing and relaxing. And do that conscious relaxation all the way up, squeezing and relaxing. Because you'll find that you have tension and stress in areas you don't realize. Mm. And then get little red dots or purple dots or whatever is going to help you. And put up around your home and office about eye level. To say stop for one minute. How am I breathing? Mm. And go back to that good, calm, abdominal breathing. And it will add years to a person's life and help them be uh, look healthier and young. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for that. Such good advice. This is invaluable information, guys. I hope you're getting this. Take notes. Um, I have a question also about digestive issues. This seems to be coming up a lot, too, with bloating, gas, and indigestion. Just so many people with, and I suffer from that for years. Can you speak of this and can you give some advice? Yes. 
Um, the main problem is people have gotten in such a rush that they are running through a fast food restaurant, grabbing this, grabbing that, eating on the go, talking on the phone at the same time. Um, and those foods are laden with sugar, 2,500 preservatives, all kinds of chemicals that are causing all kinds of damage in their digestive tract. The liver doesn't know what to do with high fructose corn syrup. It does not know what to do with hyd hydrogenated oils, you know, and it just becomes all clogged up. And then the bile is not getting into the digestive tract to help proper digestion. So I think the number one thing is to slow down mm -hmm. and start preparing food at home and having going to your organic market, or if you're lucky enough, pulling your food from the garden and preparing your food at home and eating slowly, sitting down and not watching the news or something negative on television and eating with reverence because that food is life force, it's getting, giving us life. Mm -hmm. And all of those vegetables are giving us enzymes which we need in order to digest. And so I feel like um, people are combining foods improperly. Uh, they're eating starches and protein together. They're eating two proteins at the same meal that may be hard to digest together. They're not eating vegetables with enzymes that help improve digestion. So I just feel like if they slow down and when they sit down to the table, do stop and breathe the way I've taught you five times and eat slowly and chew. First digestion starts in the mouth with the saliva and the chewing. Mm -hmm. So just becoming more conscious, um, if we followed the laws of God and nature, we would never be ill. We'd never have a problem. We would be living in harmony, rhythm, and balance. We would be eating foods directly from the earth, and we would be much healthier the way we were designed to be. And that's why I named my book, Health is Your Birthright, mm. How to Create the Health You Deserve. Because we've just gotten so far away from the way we were naturally meant to eat, drink, sleep, live, and love. Mm. Yes, thank you. Well, wow, it's so peaceful being with you. You transmit uh, so much peace and just well-being. It's so relaxing. <laughs> yeah, it's important to practice the presence of peace. Mm -hmm. The more we practice that presence, a real living presence of peace inside, we can navigate better in this very stressful world and work really much on allowing good thoughts in and blocking negative thoughts because they're all out there all the time. Mm -hmm. And if we just remember the word stop and when our hearts start racing, we get nervous or a negative thought comes in, oh my gosh, I'm going to do poorly today or something critical, we need to stop. Just use the word stop, breathe, and change that thought to an affirmative. I am calm, confident, and strong. Every day I'm healthier. Every day I'm stronger. And the more we practice this, the more we'll get a good hang of it. It's like riding a bicycle. At first you fall off. And the more you ride, you become in more rhythm and harmony. Mm. So we need to love ourselves. That's the bottom line. That is, it's easier said than done, I think. Yes. <clears throat> Some people don't realize that loving ourselves means to care for ourselves mm. on all levels. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Jensen, I want to ask you also about blood sugar issues, something that comes up a lot as well. People seem to be suffering with the blood sugar going, and I know I had this for years. It would go up, I would crash. 
Can you speak of this? Can you give us some advice? Yes. Um, blood sugar levels can be genetic. Mm. There, and I can see it in the eyes. If there's been blood sugar issues, we'll see it in the pancreas areas of the iris. Okay. There'll be an opening there. Um, and so that shows generations of an imbalanced pancreas. One time I took the eye pictures of five generations, all the way from the great great grandmother in the rest home, who was 98, down to the great great granddaughter. And all through those generations, they ate more and more fast foods and sugar. And all through those generations, that sign got bigger and bigger and bigger. So by the time I photographed the 16-year-old great-great-granddaughter, she was 350 pounds already, and she was eating whole cartons of ice cream, whole jars of mayonnaise, because she craved sugar so badly. Mm -hmm. So that means when we crave sugar, our body is way out of balance. I myself used to crave sugar. Me too. I used to say it walked my legs and drove my car because I couldn't really pass by some place that had something delicious without stopping. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> like donuts or whatever it was. Yes. As, but I felt terrible. I did not feel good. Mm -hmm. I did not have energy. I was, I was weak. And so, and there is diabetes in my, a lot of diabetes in mm -hmm. my family. So I learned about hypoglycemia, which is an inherited trait where the in, you're producing too much insulin that drops your sugar. It gobbles up all your sugar and drops you really low. And the more sugar you eat, the worse that cycle becomes. Yeah. And I was in that cycle. And so we need to stop and get the nutrients we need that nourish the, uh, the pancreas area. And um, so eating maybe small, highly nourishing snacks throughout the day. For example, you can eat uh, good celery. Celery is amazing with some um, raw tahini in there or raw hummus in there or raw almond butter, those are going to stabilize your blood sugar and keep you on a level balanced keel. Mm -hmm. If you have not enough insulin and you're diabetic, um, you, your pancreas has quit producing insulin altogether. And there, the herb called berberin is a natural insulin. It's amazing for helping a person keep their sugar levels low and improve the insulin function. So I feel like also that stress makes uh, us crave sweets more because when we are under stress and we're firing adrenaline, it kicks the pancreas to produce too much insulin that drops us really low. So people that are drinking a lot of coffee in the morning um, that are produced, that caffeine is kicking the adrenals to produce a lot of adrenaline. By 10 o'clock, they're wanting that donut. Yeah. Because the insulin has gobbled up all their blood sugar. So to maybe have oat straw tea in the morning, something soothing, nourishing, and calming, um, their, their raw juices or blended smoothie in the morning is going to help hold them more steady than just a cup of coffee with caffeine, which is acidic. Mm, so you definitely do not recommend caffeine at all? <laughs> well, I don't recommend it, but if people are on it, I believe that a green tea is going to be less acidic or if they have coffee, maybe uh, organic, low acid coffee, um, and then don't have more than four ounces. Mm. Be because we, you know, it makes our hearts beat harder. It makes our adrenals push harder. Um, 
So, you know, we just need to have respect for caffeine. Mm. It took me forever to kick that habit. So I will never go back to it. I yeah. feel for people trying to get rid of the ca uh, caffeine addiction is very, very hard. We want to have our own energy and not rely on caffeine. Mm -hmm. Wow, good advice. Um, I want to ask you about the difference between emotional iridology and physical iridology, because we spoke about that briefly when we saw each other. Can you speak to this a little bit? Oh, I love emotional iridology because the eyes tell us so much about our um, emotions, our personality. And I give a lot of credit to Denny Johnson, who founded Rayid, which is um, the ray that comes from the id, which is the soul, out through the eyes. Um, and he mapped out through the eyes personality. Wow. And so after, after seeing, I mean, he literally worked with hundreds of people. And after seeing hundreds of people with a marking, for example, um, certain markings had to do with very creative people. Oh. And when they all had that pattern and they were all actors, actresses, singers, dancers, authors, musicians, um, we work with that as a creative pattern. Okay. Wow. And that's genetic. And people that had another certain pattern, which we call stream, those people had very tight fibers in the eyes. Those people are people like a stream in nature that's always flowing and on the go and reaches out to connect to others. They mm -hmm. make very good mediators. They're very sensitive because they feel everything. But their lesson is not to go too fast or too slow, to find balance and nurture themselves. So there are many patterns. We can also tell right brain creative and left brain analytical from the eyes. Because if you're born with more patterns in your right eye, right eye connects with left brain, um, which is analytical. If you're born with more patterns in your left eye, connects with right brain, that means they're more creative in life. So there are many, many things we can look in the iris. Um, we have a sign in the iris that shows whether people are extroverted or introverted, if they love harmony and peace more, they make a good listener, a good counselor. We, think we see a ring of purpose in the eyes and those people feel like they must have purpose, just any old thing won't do. And there's another ring called the ring of perfection. So um, some people tend to be perfectionist. So all of those personality traits can go along to affect us physically. So people that tend to be perfectionist may get ulcers easily. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many traits and we work with them all together, body, mind, and spirit through our radiology to help the whole person come into alignment. And I also give credit to Dr. Daniele Larito of Italy, who did a whole lot of research on emotions and patterns in the eyes as well. Okay, so that was my question. How, I was just thinking to myself, so how can you help someone emotionally with eye readology? But that, you just pretty much answer that. Well, if you point out their personality traits, um, and guide them, for example, if there is a stream, a tight fiber pattern, and they're rushing all the time, okay. you want to tell them that's a trait, but they're very intuitive, sensitive people. So we want to tell them your practice in life is to be calm and meditate so that you can use your gift of intuition and sensitivity Otherwise, you're going to be frantic all the time. Mm. Um, if we find a person with a sign that's 
accomplisher and an achiever, those people tend to have lots of irons in the fire all the time and just spread themselves way too thin mm. and feel anxious inside. And um, so we can tell them, look, you're a great accomplisher. You come from a long line of hard workers. Uh, but your lesson is to learn to stop and choose what's really important and prioritize. So when we see these signs, we learn the balance of them and how to teach the person with that particular sign how to lead their lives in balance. And I feel like the eyes teach us how to um, captain our ships going through stormy seas. Mm. and teach us what our traits are, what our gifts are uniquely, and how to use those traits and gifts wisely um, through our lives, mm. how to guide our ships properly. Wow. So, Dr. Jensen, do you do, obviously, you, you read your own eyes. Do you seem, sometimes, do you feel like you might be, be burdened by what you see, like, do you see it's almost like you can see into the future you can see things coming you can see things in other people that are coming how how do you do that how do you deal with well, that we want um we want to work when we see those signs on prevention hmm. so if we see them coming that's our task for our lives our bodies uniquely to work with that so when I look in my own eyes, I see um, a person that is a listener and a counselor who loves harmony and peace, who's sensitive and creative. But I really need time alone mm. to shore up my energy. And I must follow that or I become more stressed because I have those traits. Mm -hmm. And the other traits I have in my eyes specifically are um, a genetic nurture point in my back, which had scoliosis. So that means I have to really watch my minerals and my exercise and uh, because I want a lot out of my life. If I don't follow a really good plan, then my back will, be, will come in pain. Mm. And so um, I've learned that and I've taken the responsibility. I don't look out at other people and say, oh, gosh, they can do all that and nothing's bothering them because I came in this world with a harder lesson, not harder than everyone because everyone has their lesson, but I've had to work really hard to um, keep my back healthy, my body healthy. I also have it a sign in my eyes to that I need to take care of my limbs. Mm -hmm. So if I eat wheat, milk, and sugar, it is very congesting for me, all through my sinuses, my throat, my lungs. Um, I can tend to have arthritis if I don't take care of myself because um, it's in my family and it's in my eyes. Mm -hmm. So knowing those things, I don't take it for granted that I know those things. And I work with myself to um, to follow good a good plan that works for me. Mm, that is so good. And so, would you mind sharing what sort of a diet do you follow? Well, I like, for example, I love smoothies for breakfast. So I love my liver cleansing smoothie a lot. So I'll soak almonds and make almond milk unsweetened and I'll put like a half a cup in the blender and I might put some plant-based protein in there. I put a whole cup of mixed greens in there. I put a half a cucumber which is anti-inflammatory, a couple of stalks of celery. The juice of celery is almost identical to the lymph fluid which alkalinizes our lymph. I put a small red raw beet in there, which cleans my liver, the juice of half a lemon, and I put a tablespoon of chia seeds and hemp seeds, and I blend that all up. It's a very delicious uh, breakfast. 
Mm. So, you know, then I have a big, big salad for lunch with all kinds of sprouts and sprouted beans and sprouted seeds in there. Mm -hmm. And for dinner, I possibly will make another blended smoothie. I make a soup that's raw and blended mm -hmm. with a half a cup of water, lots of greens, celery, half an avocado, cucumber. Um, I might put in some zucchini and yellow squash, um, aroma tomato, which is lower in acid, some pepperoncinis I might put, or parsley, a lot of cilantro, because mm -hmm. cilantro pulls heavy metals out of the body. Mm -hmm. So I blend that up into a creamy soup. Mm -hmm. I put maybe some basil, thyme, dill, a garlic, um, and then I put it in a bowl with some pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds. That makes a delicious soup. You can warm it, but don't ever boil it. Mm. So that I might, that's something I might have in the evening. Sometimes I may have some, um, oh, steamed vegetables with um, a salad, things like that. So I try very hard to stick with a lot from the vegetable kingdom and nuts and seeds. Okay, okay. And if you were to eat some cooked food, it would be steamed veggies? Or what? cooked beans. Okay. But I am one that must soak them, or I may get problems with uh, my digestion. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Jensen. You've been so good. I have a couple more questions. Um, I want to ask you about the vision and how it deteriorates for most of us as we age. Is this preventable? What can we do? It seems like every year prescriptions get thicker, your glasses get thicker, your eyesight. This is part one of my question. And two, do you recommend laser surgery for the eyes? Uh, that's an excellent question. I just went, um, I'm 66 years old, and I went for my driving. I had to go for a vision test. Because apparently when I'm, I, I haven't had to renew my license in years. They just sent me a new one. But um, I went for a vision test and I passed it with no glasses. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah. But honestly, our eyes are made of blood vessels. And so all the blood from our body flows through our eyes. So we want to keep our blood vessels limber and pliable with omega-3 which can come from clary sage oil, chia oil, borage oil, uh, flax oil. All of those oils are very lubricating to the vessels of our body. Mm. And then bioflavonoids are very important to the eyes because bioflavonoids strengthen tissues. So bioflavonoids we would find in oranges, lemons, grapefruits, um, all the vegetables. Cabbage is high in bioflavonoids. Cabbage, by the way, is amazing for blood vessels, including varicose veins and hemorrhoids. Okay. Um, it's great. So the other thing that's high in bioflavonoids for the eyes are wild blueberries. Mm. So I often put wild blueberries in my uh, smoothies. Okay. And um, wild blueberries are called bilberry in German. And so a lot of eye formulas have bilberry in them oh. because of the bioflavonoids. Yeah. And so these, all these nutrients are very important for keeping the eyes strong. And I also recommend that if not to wear sunglasses so much, mm. to go out side and let your eyes be in the sunlight and I'm not talking about directly looking in the sun but I'm talking about every time you go out don't wear your glasses just let your eyes get fresh air and sunshine mm. and I also recommend palming you just rub your hands together get them really warm and lay them over your eyes when your eyes are tired because you're putting real good energy back into your eyes. Mm -hmm. I also recommend getting plenty of sleep. Um, you know, 
to go to bed at nine or 10 and get up at around six or seven and let your eyes really rest at night. Mm -hmm. And don't stay always focused on your cell phones or your iPads or your television. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know about these electric magnetic frequencies that can weaken our eyes. So we need to turn away from those and look out in the sky. If you've been having to work on your computer, stop and look out a window or go outside for five minutes mm. to daily work with your eyes. Carrots and carrot juice are amazing for the eyes. They're very strengthening. They're high in vitamin A. So I think if we do all these things, they're very healing. You can even use, um, like if your eyes are really tired, Slice the cucumber and, and lie down and put it on your eyes. It's very soothing and anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Is is it reversible by bad eyesight? Like once you have a prescription on, for your eyesight, it can you lessen it like some? Absolutely, I've oh. seen that many times. Absolutely, I worked with a girl one time who was legally blind, and helped her get her driver's license. Wow. Okay. So I've seen the eyes improve really greatly with all these things. And eye exercises, just looking up, looking down to the side, keeping your muscles. There are six muscles that hold the eyes in place and help them turn. Mm -hmm. So we need to exercise our eyes like we do the rest of our body. Okay. And uh, what about LASIK surgery and contact lenses? Do you recommend either of those? Not necessarily. Okay. Because um, I've, what happens with LASIK, it may work at first or they may botch it up. Mm. Uh, it's rare that they do, but I'm the one that gets all the people that have had it botched. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's good, they can see really well for a while. But if they're not getting the nutrients they need for their eyes, their eyes are going to go right back to the way they were. Mm. so that surgery will only last so long yes as far as contacts if a person got contacts they would need to be soft contacts and um maybe not use them that often um try to take them out and let your eyes feel free but you know contacts are always there and they can affect the vessels eventually in the eyes Mm, yes. And so do you recommend disposable contact lenses, the kind that you wear clean, a clean pair every day, or it, does that make any difference? Um, I, I think possibly uh, dis disposable may be the better way to go, mm -hmm. um, just because I, I think to leave them in there a long time is not the best idea. Yeah. So let your eyes breathe, basically. Yes, it's amazing that I've just been invited by the National Opticians Association to speak on iridology. Mm -hmm. So, so it, I think they're starting to become ready to understand how to help their patients more with, you know, eye exercises and nutrition. Yes. And how can we find a good uh, eye doctor ophthalmologist? Because I know it's it's even they don't know anything about iridology. They don't understand the eye. They want to give you a thicker prescription every year. How can we find a good eye doctor? Well, I know one. His name is Dr. Jeffrey Anshul, and he's written many books. You can Google Dr. Jer uh, Jeffrey Anshul, and he's written lots of books on natural therapies and nutrients for the eyes. Okay. And so I don't know specific ones in different states, but I do know that he's a pioneer, Dr. Anshul, and he's written some excellent books. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And where can people find you? And do you uh, offer coaching, consultation? How, how do you work, Dr. Jensen? Can you share that? Well, I would say they would need to email me at Ellen, E-L-L-E-N, at life l-i-f-e style s-t-y-l-e council c-o-u-n-s-e-l dot com mm -hmm. for an appointment 
or go on my website, myinfiniteiris.com, to learn about my classes and my books and my nutrients that I've put together. Okay, and I will link all that information below. I will get all the all the uh, what Dr. Ellen just said. I'll just put that down below. So I have a really good supportive product that I put together called Sun Food. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yeah. And it has a rainbow on it because I really believe in rainbow colors in our diet, like a rainbow salad. Uh huh. And I literally developed this product for myself because it balances blood sugar. Mm. It helps you not to crave sweet. It balances the thyroid. It helps to clean the liver and the blood. It has many great nutrients in it. Um, chlorella, barley grass, uh, seaweed, beets, bioflavonoids from um, from acerola cherries mm. and many good nutrients that do all the things we talked about today. Okay. And um, so I recommend like two twice a day and I won't travel without it because it's like a living salad in a capsule. It's all organic and wild crafted. And people can get that through your website too? Yes, myinfiniteiris.com. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Uh, You're most welcome. It's been my pleasure. Yes, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for tuning in today. I hope you have gotten as much as I have from Dr. Ellen Jensen. This has been invaluable information, you guys. So I will link all her information down below. Thank you so much for watching. Give this video a big thumbs up and I will see you in my next video. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.